Yes, okay. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, we will start this uh, webinar. This is the, the, the last one of this uh, Open Education Week. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for being here um, on, on this uh, webinar. Um, let me say a few words uh, just to start. We are very proud to participate, of course, in, in this uh, Open Education Week uh, from Eden. Um, as you know, this, uh, this webinar this uh, week is also uh, organized by EDENT, and, 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 and this is the last one uh, of the, during, uh, the, the ones that we did during this uh, week. Uh, the topic of, of this uh, webinar is about uh, uh, um, research evidence-based uh, uh, research and also with, uh, related with open education, of course. Let me start with uh, my personal presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Duarte. I'm professor of, uh, from Open uh, from UOC, uh, Universitat Oberta de Catalunya, Open, uh, Open University of Catalonia. And also I, I'm a vice president of research of EDEN and executive uh, committee uh, member of EDEN. And also uh, with my red, which is here with us, uh, editor-in-chief of uh, International Journal uh, of Educational Technology in Higher Education. The way that we organize this uh, webinar today is uh, we will start uh, with a short presentation from our presenters. Uh, we have four presenters for today. Um, I prefer the, the presenters uh, presented by myself. And in the second part, uh, we will uh, have another round with uh, different presentations from each one of them. As you know, as, because you are probably familiar with uh, uh, this um, software, Adobe Connect, you can participate on the chat, uh, asking questions, and at the end, uh, we will have an open uh, space also to uh, ask uh, uh, these questions to the presenters. I think we can start with the uh, presentations. Uh, Paul, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone from Tempe, Arizona. Uh, I'm attending a conference here, so uh, I do apologize for my camera not being on. Maybe it's good because I'm still sleepy, uh, but I'm a research professor in Open and Distance Learning at UNISA, the University of South Africa. Uh, we were established in 1873, and we are fairly large. Uh, my current research focus is on the collection, the analysis, and the use of student data as evidence. And, and, and I would come back to that in order to improve the effectiveness of teaching and learning in open and distributed environments. And then my secondary focus is on open and distributed learning, the wide, the wide field, and mapping ecologies of open. So that's me. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Paul. Now we move to Mered. The floor is yours. Hello. Mered, can you, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, so I'm uh, yes. Mairead McGillivy Heal. I am uh, the head of the Ideas Lab and the National Institute uh, for Digital Learning in Dublin City University in Ireland. I suppose my main research focus will be looking at MOOCs and at their use and looking at areas of language research and also with regard to cultural research. We're also looking at a number of areas to do with sentiment analysis, motivation. We're looking at how we can use the data and the evidence that we are gathering in these MOOCs to inform our learning design. And another area of research which myself and Professor Mark Brown are quite interested in as well is in and around institutional research, but also looking at the macro learning environment and how what has been termed as the unbundling and rebundling of higher education and how open is contributing to that. To that. So my, we have a very dynamic research team in my unit and within the wider National Institute for Digital Learning. So we draw on many of these aspects, particularly in regards to open data and new methodologies and how we can not only influence research, but also influence policy in this area as well. Thank you, 
Thank you very much, Fred. Now we move to Andrea. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Andrea Sartelli. I'm a, a professor at the Center for the Study of Science and Humanities uh, at the University in Bergen in, uh, in, in Norway, um, which is a group of uh, kind of uh, very much applied philosophers and philosophers of science. Uh, but I'm also um, visiting fellow at Open Evident Research here in Barcelona, where I live. Uh, my topic, the my most recent paper are on sensitivity analysis, which is my historical uh, discipline, something related to mathematics and mathematical modeling, but also sensitivity auditing, which is more to do with epistemology. And I worked on a number of different topics. More recently, I've been doing a number of articles on the crisis of science and of science uh, quality control uh, system. And for this effect, and in relation to evidence-based policy, I've been working uh, to develop um, a syllabus on uh, numbers for policy, which wants exactly to address uh, some of the shortcomings and uh, pathologies of uh, uh, evidence-based policy. It is uh, intended today kind of epistemological therapy for, uh, for the responsible use of uh, quantification. OK, thank you very much, Andrea. And now, Tony. Yeah, is your, your, your time. Hello, Please. good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the, this opportunity. Uh, I am Tony Perez Navarro. I work at Universidad Oberta de Catalunya. Now I am the Deputy Director of Research at Euro Center at the University, but I am also Professor at the Computer Science Multimedia and Telecommunication Department. I am very proud of being teaching, uh, being Professor of Physics and Geographic Information Systems. And my research topics related with e-learning and mainly focus on the communication of mathematics within online environments. And lately, related with the use of videos as a teaching tool in mainly in science uh, uh, subjects, but mainly in, in physics, which is the subject that I, I that I give. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Tony. OK, as you can see, we have a... A very interesting panel today, um, and the idea now is offer the floor to this panel to make some presentations about uh, these ideas uh, that we share uh, with them uh, in order to prepare this webinar. Not uh, the idea is uh, which is the more relevant research challenge on open education today. Can evidence-based research approach offer a new, better perspective for open education research, and what kind of uh, evidence-based research methodologies are more appropriated uh, to research on open education. Of course, um, the presenters can uh, make comments with related to other to the, the, the other questions or things that they think that could be interesting to share with us today. I think we can follow the same um, the same order, and maybe uh, Paul, if you want to start with your presentation. Great, thank you very much. I just wait for the presentation to load and then uh, I will be able to see what I uh, Just some general comments. Uh, I just thought it may be good to position myself uh, from where I stand in the social sciences and then specifically in the learning sciences. I, I really think we need to engage firstly with evidence in the social imaginary. What, what do people expect of evidence? What are our assumptions about evidence? Where does this notion of evidence in education and then in open education comes from? And then we have open in the social imaginaries. Um, we tend to think in binaries of open and versus closed. And I really think when we speak about research in the open, we have to engage with the notion of open in the social imaginaries. I speak from the broader context in higher education, um, and that is a specific context. And then uh, our beliefs about the practice and the impact of educational research. So in this opening slide, I think it, that's where I would like to position uh, my, my, my contribution to this discussion is researching open and evidence in open research is positioned uh, in this ecology of evidence in the social imaginary open the broader context of uh, in higher education and then our beliefs. 
So that's just as introduction. Uh, my response to the first question, uh, thanks for these questions, uh, Joseph. Um, I had to really think hard about some of them. So, so what are the most relevant research challenges from where I am situated in open education? I think we need to think beyond binaries. It's as uh, it's not as simple as open and closed. And I really think we need to explore the ecologies making open or closed desirable. And when is open not desirable? And when is closed desirable? When is open data and making my research data open? When is it desirable? Under what conditions are some parts of my research data or my findings even not desirable? So I think we need to, to think beyond making open and close and think about ecologies. What are the, who's the stakeholders? What are the power relations in defining and making open? The second thing is, I, I think we need to move beyond definitions and declarations. Um, often in, in articles on open education and research in open education, we, re, we go back to the policies, we go back to the definitions whether it's a Cape Town declaration or whether whatever declaration. So, so my question is, what was left unsaid? Who and what is excluded in our current definitions and in our current attempts to define open? And, and who excluded them? Who are the voices that are not heard? On what basis? And what are the effects on those material and human that are not included but are affected? Um, I, I love the work of Manuel Castells that says not everyone is included, but everyone is affected. So when we, and for me, that's a research challenge to engage with, to go beyond our definitions and ask what was left unsaid, who and what is excluded, and by whom, and on what basis, and what are the effects of these inclusions and exclusions on, on everyone. The third thing that I think from where I am the most relevant research challenge in open education is realizing that all evidence are ideological. All evidence, in my view, is preliminary until further notice. Uh, all evidence is contested and fragile. So, so um, from again, this is very, very personal, but I do think that uh, we need to be very sober about evidence. I'm now at the learning. Uh, analytics and knowledge conference and and there's an increasing realization that the evidence presented last year has since been found not to be true anymore or had gaps in it. And I think there's an openness in our claims about evidence to say this is ideological, it's preliminary. We, from what we know, they, until further notice, this is the claims we can make. It can be contested and it is increasingly fragile. The second question is, um, and this is an interesting one, can evidence-based research offer a new and better perspective? And I was wondering what would make it new uh, and better than what? Um, it, what, 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 what does evidence-based research, as if we, yeah, do we find the research that is not evidence-based? So what is new about this and, and and better than what? And then the second point with regard to that is, to what extent can evidence be open and not close off interrogation and critique? Um, and I've already referred to that in the sense of, um, are we open about our processes, the decisions that led us to accept a certain methodology as appropriate to this question? Will we make our data open? Will we share our findings? There's some things that we will not share or we won't be allowed to share. So, so to what extent can evidence be open and not close off interrogation and critique? And then the third point in, in this question is, how is evidence-based research different in open education compared to non-open education? So I, I first want to question, is there any research that is not evidence-based? <laughs> well, even conceptual and theoretical research, there's evidence. So, so my, I want to contest and destabilize this question to say, 
is there evidence-based research that is not evidence-based? <laughs> is there any research that is not evidence-based? And then secondly, uh, the evidence in open education, does it really differ from non-open education? So yeah, uh, this question really had me wondering. The third and final question, what kind of evidence-based research methodologies are more appropriate to research on open education? And I was wondering, uh, methodologies depend on it should flow from the research question. So what are the questions? So uh, if, if they, we have a whole basket full of methodologies, quantitative as well as qualitative, and, 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 and I really think all those methodologies can be appropriate depending on what are your questions. The second thing is um, what research methodologies are not focused on gathering and reporting on evidence. So when we think about what is appropriate, what methodologies are appropriate, then I would like to say that all methodologies are focused to, to present evidence, whether theoretical, conceptual, or empirical. And then my last point, and I think I'm within your time limits, Joseph, is how will the evidence be disseminated? Will we do research in open education but published in a closed journal, which I find is ironic. Uh, and I will not refer to the journal, the recent journal um, that published, that is not an open journal. It's uh, beyond the firewall, beyond the paywall. But they had a special issue on open education, and 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 I was just thinking, what really? Um, so so, how will the evidence in open education be disseminated? So even though we do research in in open, we can present the findings in closed environments, and who will have access to the findings? Will we allow? Will we make our data sets open? Or will that be behind firewalls and paywalls? And how will the findings be open and open up for further spaces? We publish our articles and we publish our findings sort of as a fait accompli. Uh, this is where we are. And there's no space for interrogation. We need to move on to the next publication. So that is my humble contribution. Thank you so much, Joseph. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Very, very interesting to me. <laughs> and I'm sure for a lot of the attendants too, to this uh, webinar. Uh, please, if you have any comments or questions, uh, you can continue writing, of course, in, in the chat. And, and we try to collect some of them uh, for the last part of the, um, of the webinar. OK, now, now we can move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, Mayred, is your turn. Okay. I'll just wait for the slides to come up. I think this is your slides. OK, so what I wanted to talk about, I, I think um, Paul has spoken more at the macro level. I wanted to drill down into some of the research that we've been doing and to highlight some of the issues that we've done, we found within the literature um, and also to do with some of the studies that um, particularly within our in our field and in our particular research area. So we're doing research uh, and we're drawing from a lot of data that we garner and collect from uh, the MOOCs that we have run, which are Irish language and cultural MOOCs that we deliver through the Future Learn platform. So we've quite a number of people and learners who engage in these, and we've had a huge amount of as you'd expect through the MOOCs that we deliver, we have a huge amount of data points and evidence and et cetera. And I'll come back to the notion of data versus evidence in a few minutes. But this is basically, I just want to give you certain sort of context to the work that we do and that we're currently looking at. So for me, when I was looking at these, when we look at the this, and what, one of the major criticisms and challenges we would see in this area is really well, designing well, well defined and well scoped research, and this comes down to looking at the data and then the particular questions that we have. And I'll come back to this again when we talk to methodologies. For me, some of the issues in this, and uh, we've had to grapple with these as well, is looking at the ethical issues. 
Um, and, you know, Salwin has said, you know, this notion of data valence, even though we put in, like many others who do this type of research, we have all our clearance, ethical clearance, we attempt to at all times at all times to inform the learner that we are collecting these and also to inform them of our results and our findings. I suppose they're particularly aware of our findings when we alert them to a change in our learning design based on something that we have done or learned from what they have done. So one of the issues I suppose for me is that when we look at learners in this sort of space that, you know, it reminded me of that famous marketing saying that, you know, in the 70s that came up was that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, you know. So our learners are aware that the data that they are providing is, will be used by us, by researchers, but also by commercial entities. Um, and I think sometimes they're not always aware. And you can say, I suppose it's like all of us when we get our phone and we try to turn it on and we download something and we see the terms and conditions and 27 pages that follow with terms and conditions. I, I, we usually all go, yes, that's fine. I just want to use um, whatever, whatever product or service that I want to use. For me, a, com com a complicating factor for a lot of the research that we're doing is a tension between the commercial business model of MOOC providers and what we're trying to do um, in our, with our own research agenda. And this tension, as uh, I think Paul there has um, mentioned also, is that our learners, our learners now are product, and are we looking at them from that point of view? We're also looking at how the platform in itself has shaped and influenced, and in some way bounded the type of research that we can do. And we've also looked at ways in how we've had to become a lot more rigorous and a lot more um, having to engage with the platform and explain to them and make them understand as best as they can the why particular research, why particular research questions demand particular um, research design, etc., where they have felt and from coming from the point of view that they're coming from, that research in this area can be done to very specific ways. For me, um, a lot of the, the challenges is, is that in studies and in the literature, particularly where it's empirical literature, literature being reported on, that there is a lot of there is a lot of there is an absence of theory. That's one of the things, whether it's theory at the start or theory produced based on it or influenced because of the study. And also there is a lack of acknowledgement, I think, in many studies of the type of weird <laughs> uh, learners that we have on a lot of these platforms, uh, particularly the commercial platforms, where we have Western educated, industrial rich, and democratic. So I'm trying not to be I'm trying not to be abusive to anybody, but just it's a nice acronym, and sometimes we don't say our research is a little bit based on some, the representative of this is a little bit weird. Looking at the new, better perspective, um, kind of, I'm sort of in the same vein as Paul on this. I, was, I, I wanted to say, well, in one way, I'm on the fence. Um, it can, and it doesn't necessarily have to either. I think for interdisciplinary research, I think, yes, there obviously is particularly benefits that can be derived from this. I know from our own, what we have found, particularly in language learning, is that the, some, of the, some of the research that is done on language learning, particularly in open and online and digital environments, doesn't draw on many of the existing research that have been completed in the main body of the disciplinary literature, whether it's within call, whether it's in applied linguistics. So I think there's definitely um, some there's definitely some need for us to realise that in our findings, and this is the point with regards to um, how our findings not only influence open education, but also looking to some of the base disciplines that we are using and we are drawing from, from our theoretical standpoints. So I think that was my main point that I want to make in that, in relation to this. And finally, and I probably, I think from our point of view, and we are as, and I'm not claiming that we're better or do it any differently from anybody else, and we, we do have a particular notion within my research group in the NIDL that we um, look to many times for a mixed method methodology because not only to answer the specific research questions that we want to address, 
but also because of the over-reliance on particular quantitative methodologies because the data is available um, and it provides certain, provide certain insights. But I think some of those insights are limited and they limit the type of questions that are being put and are being answered. So I think there's a place for more nuanced questions, but then again, more nuanced um, designs to come out of that with respect to the methodologies. And I think in some recent research that we've done, we've adopted a qualitative interpretive approach. And we were using this to, to, to give an example. We had, I think, over 25,000 um, pieces of um, data, if you wanted to put it like that, to interrogate. So to do that in a research team would have taken a huge amount of time. But we had tried to adopt a methodology by using particular tools and then by doing some um, work with that from a human standpoint to allow us for that interpretive approach. I think that has been a particular insight that we have that we have we have found as well um, has made and it has made a difference not only in terms of allowing us to ask deeper questions but also to provide better answers in some way. So for us, I think the methodologies is becoming really, really important and becoming, and it all boils down to this, if how our research is designed. Um, finally, I just want to conclude, I think just to come back to one of the comments that came up. And for me, I think in this whole element of it, I think we have to stand away from snapshot accounts, if at all possible. Where there, I think, and this is where we come back into and whether my understanding of process is different from others. But for me, where we have process and longitudinal research, I think that can add a lot more. And because of the types of data that come our way, I think it provides us with a unique and rich opportunity to incorporate longitudinal designs and to avoid snapshot shot accounts where we could particularly just focus on very limited areas. So I'm going to hand over now, um, uh, I think I've said enough, and I'm going to hand on to the next presenter, but I'd be very interested in your thoughts in respect to these. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much. I think uh, there is a different comments, very interesting ones on the chat too, uh, about your uh, comments. Uh, this interesting uh, last approach about methodologies and thank you very much and and of course uh, we can use the chat uh, for uh, the questions and to share uh, your comments etc um we can move to the next presenter i think now it's the thank you jota uh, i will not be uh, showing a, a slide um, I'll try to to stay uh, on the on the on the track of the discussion of the last. So I will start straight away what uh, with what are today the most relevant research challenges in open education. Uh, I would say that I have a strange feeling these days that we are living some sort of ancien regime where, in a sense, we appear not to be processing uh, important signals of danger which we. Uh, received from from society, including from the world of uh, education, um, and open education should be particularly concerned by that. Seeing what uh, appears to be um, the strong, I might say, devastating impact of uh, new media on all what which concerns our life, including uh, education and the way we go about living. Um, uh, I have in front of me, which uh, plays as my slide, uh, this, uh, I don't know if you can see, this is a uh, recent book by, by uh, Jaron Lanier on, on social account and the effect of um, new media technology. And the second book I've been reading recently, I don't know if you can read it, this is uh, again from the last book from Yuval Harari, again on lessons on, uh, uh, for the 21st century, which has an interesting chapter, chapter 19 on, on education, and I'll say, a few words about that. Why should all these concern us? Uh, well, because the impact of these new media is, in a sense, uh, extremely severe in terms of, 
of, uh, um, for instance, our participation to the public life. You all have heard how this media can be used to deter uh, people from civic participation, from political participation. How can they be used to stimulate anger and frustration? Um, and um, uh, also how these uh, uh, tools, even when they are not explicitly designed to uh, confuse us, actually stalk anger uh, and division among us only because this is the way the algorithm is designed. The algorithm is designed to keep us glued to the, to the, um, to the product as long as possible and as a result any kind of item which make us uh, react uh, uh, possibly in an aggressive way uh, is used and, and is in, and in produced as a result, uh, at least according to to uh, people like Lanier and uh, uh, Arari, um, make, in a sense, it makes us worse human beings. So less capable of maturing, of uh, growing, on, on, and and developing. Um, and all this uh, mm, mm, uh, is a challenge which, in open education, I think should be taken very, very seriously. What, what are we teaching to uh, these people? Should we change what we are teaching to young people in light of what is happening? Uh, and I heard that some people think we should be talking, teaching the, the critical thinking, the communication, the collaboration, the creativity, the 4C. Uh, Arari, in his chapter I just mentioned, says that all what we need to teach is it's just uh, flexi mental flexibility and uh, uh, a great reserve of emotional stability because the, the life of uh, our young will be, uh, um, you know, in the in the in the embrace of the gig economy is uh, likely to uh, generate a considerable amount of uh, frustration and. I don't need to go very far because even in academy we know we are now witnessing a process of uh, proletarianization of research labor force. Uh, those of you who have followed the recent uh, debate in the UK following Brexit linked to the minimum wage which will uh, jump from 21,000 pounds to 30 pounds because you know European will no longer be part of uh, the, the, the common market so that we have to show that they earn more. All universities have said, no, 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 we cannot <laughs> pay that much as a, is a clear evidence sign of, you know, the kind already what, what kind of mechanism we have in, uh, in, uh, in act, what is, what is happening, what is already the way uh, our academy uh, work. Um, then you had a, a second question which is, uh, quite interesting because you say, can evidence-based research approach offer a new and better perspective to open edu education research? Well, I, I participate to what uh, Paul has said. We have to discuss what we mean by open and what we mean by evidence. Uh, I have recently published a paper entitled What is wrong with evidence-based policy? And in the paper I argue that uh, there exists a lot of rhetoric about the use of the word evidence and furthermore the evidence-based policy um, kind of ideology um, hide a fundamental knowledge uh, asymmetry which if you wish is part of some kind of um, neoliberal way of approaching the problem of evidence for policy. It's obvious that if we are talking about evidence, those who have more money can, can pay for more evidence, and this is only too evident if you look at some present-day uh, controversy, even in concerning the environment, concerning food, concerning a number of other, uh, concerning new technology. Um, there is really a, a fundamental power asymmetry in the use of evidence about which we should reflect or we should do something about that by way perhaps of uh, redressing this kind of, um, uh, of asymmetry. Uh, and then you have also the, the idea that uh, behind this evidence-based policy approach is always the idea that you can easily uh, linearize the problem you have under study. For instance, you know, de uh, developing uh, or work working around concept of cost-benefit, efficiency, and so on and the like. 
um, uh, upholding at the same time some idea that uh, the technique which you use are neutral, you know, the neutrality of the technique, which is totally, uh, totally disingenuous. The technique is never neutral, and especially if you adopt uh, uh, techniques of evidence-based policy which um, resort to uh, strategies of uh, cost-benefit analysis, you have made a very clear choice which uh, will, uh, of course, very well favor um, again the same kind of ideology which maybe has produced some of the problems which you would wish to uh, to address so i would say uh, we should be uh, uh, quite careful evidence based policy most often is uh, uh, policy based evidence we all know that but uh, the issue of power asymmetry is really important uh, to wrap up i think that um, again to go to the idea of the ancien regime um, we have this um, situation where we have young people in front of us and we don't have a clue how will be the labor market uh, a, a few years from now. Maybe I can now show you one, one more book. Uh, this was, maybe some of you have seen it, it is the second machine age of Bjorn Opson and McAfee, uh, where they describe. This book is a very honest book because though it's written by technologists, it's very clear on the challenges which uh, this new technology are facing. Uh, um, and how what, what will happen with jobs? You know, the, even Arari in his chapter says ch change will be the only constancy in all that. Um, so not knowing what uh, what we will have to, uh, what, how we can prepare people uh, to uh, uh, to face the new challenges, to face a world dominated by platform capitalism. Uh, I believe this will be, uh, in a sense, uh, the challenge of of. Uh, of, um, of, of, the, of an activity. Uh, and, and again, so to what extent can uh, uh, evidence-based research help all that? Well, I would say that then if we agree that we have a challenge, if we agree that we have all these pathologies or dystopia I've been mentioning uh, so far, I think that <laughs> our role and our duty in, in this kind of situation would be uh, to make those pathology uh, and to make this dystopia evident um, and to uh, start a discussion uh, around uh, around this uh, topic Ooh, well i think i have co covered what i uh, what i wanted uh, to say and thank you for, for for your attention thank you very much andrea for sharing these interesting ideas uh, I'm sure uh, you can follow the chat and, and there is a very interesting also comments from Paul and recommendations of books, etc. and from other people. I think it's um, very interesting to follow also the chat uh, and see these recommendations too. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now we are moving to the last presenters today, uh, to Tony Perez. Tony, the floor is yours. Okay, I think that I am I'm on mute. Okay, thank you for. Uh, it's difficult to be the the last presenter because most of the interesting things have already been said. So, but I, I will try to add some some new item items to the discussion. Uh, first of all. Uh, First of all, let, let me show you the, the mission and vision of the strategic plan of research at your center. Actually, we want to put in the, the very center of, the, of our, our research, the evidence-based research, but also what we call translational research. What we say with that is that that research has to be applied to the students and to the real situations, and this experience has to be uh, generate evidences that have to come back to our research and then create like a cycle of truly realimentation. Then let's answer these questions taking into account that we are working in that perspective. How open is this evidence-based research approach according to your experience? Okay, uh, in my personal opinion and experience, uh, talking about openness and uh, uh, evidence-based research is about is talking about two different topics. 
uh, you can make uh, evidence-based research and not making it open, and you can make uh, open uh, any kind of research. So, uh, what uh, for me what is important is uh, how we have been talking during this uh, seminar about um, of this topic a lot, but there's a thing that is important also for me that is that if we are talking about open, open for us has to mean that has to be available to everybody. So when we are making uh, evidence-based research, many times it is just in the kingdom of research and it's, it doesn't arrive to the practitioners, to, it doesn't arrive to the society mm -hmm. and to make that uh, research available to everybody. So what I think is that we should have to, to think in open like an uh, open to everybody and not only talking about the license. Open it and make it understandable and useful for everybody. Maybe we should have to create after that research what we call here practitioner guides uh, of the showing the, the degree of evidence. If we, it's more or less the, the something that takes right your attention here is more or less the same that the medicine was lived in the 20th century when uh, the research was performed, but most of the practitioners didn't know about it. Can evidence-based research approach offer a new and better perspective to the open education? Here, I want to, to show you two examples of the, ex we have made at Tiller Center that can make this, uh, the, the effects of the research and two calls that we have created to promote this kind of research to show the challenges. Here you see one example that we created a new way to show uh, the materials to the students, what we call new, is a different way to show materials, but also the different access to the materials. Okay, it was created, it was put in the classroom, but it has been researched, the research about this uh, uh, intervention, what has made the main changes. When we have known actually what it was happening and a true research to, uh, have gives uh, it as evidences, of which changes we should have to, to introduce. Then we see uh, an example of how a research can make us to change an intervention. The second change is a spree that is born for a, for a research based on dropout at online universities. At online universities, dropout is pretty high. You will see the first semester is 28%. And there was a, a, an important research performed by my colleagues uh, regarding dropout. And through these evidences, some in changes were introduced at UOC. For example, the, to group some subjects, to, to make some special calendars. But what is important that these changes were born from evidence-based research. And these changes, changes are having a true impact in the, at the UOC uh, drop out. Then we see that research has an impact in the students, but also has an economical impact because a uh, reduction of dropout, of course, implies that you have people more years in, at, at the university. Also, the other said that from our perspective, we have seen the research that was performing, but what I would like also to draw your attention is that these kind, two kind of projects that are projects that what try to do is Yet from the very beginnings, the kind of thing that they, they put into attention is that you uh, researchers have to perform evidence-based research. On the other side, we have to make open evidence-based research because of the uh, uh, university uh, rules. So mm, I cannot show examples because they are just starting of next year to show some examples about this. Then what kind of evidence research methodologies are more appropriate to research on open education? Before answer the question about methodologies, I would like to drive the attention about data. Evidence base is based on data. So uh, also we have seen in previous uh, presentations that also is important theoretical, mm -hmm. theoretical approach, the ethics about data, but we have to get data. So what is important is to get data about what the students are doing or what we are uh, looking at uh, is doing. We have, for example, this kind of access to the kind of uh, actions that the students do. But uh, what is important is to, the evidence has to be based in data that act into really quality and curated data. So the evidence would be as good as, good as the data will be. In that sense, uh, it's something that I would like to drive the attention before. 
then what will be the right methodology as we have seen from Paul that's a research question will define the right methodology but if I had to choose one uh, I would choose the group control methodology that would drive as a very powerful and relevance of the results we get and of course uh, with a high end but it's something that many methodologies according to the question can be the right ones there is something that I would like also to drive the attention is regarding some new techniques that are, uh, are getting now very common, like for example, applying artificial intelligence techniques to research. It was a very good presentation in the, uh, the last hidden research workshop about this topic. And it's something that we have to be very careful because these methodologies can show us the what, but not the why. So we have not to, we have to take into account what are they doing. It's more or less Andrea has already talked about this topic also before. And what the more relevant ch challenges? For me, I would, I would like I would, to drive the, the attention to four topics. First of all, the, as, I say, as I said, the gap between researchers and practitioners. Then I propose maybe to create these open guides to practitioners. I would think that it's important to get a standardization level of the level of quality of every research. Not level of quality of the research, but the, uh, the, the quality of the evidence. For example, it's not the same to make uh, a research with control group in several institutions in several can different countries with thousands of students, the results will be very strong than a research in a smaller school with fewer students. So how can we say society which is, of the, is, which is more reliable with, in a very easy way? For example, I propose these levels of reliability that is the, more or less the same that we find in, in pharmacy. Uh, to give systematic reviews in education the level they have in medicine. Here the example of medicine is very good because they have very open databases with a, a lot of uh, systematic reviews and you have very information of the evidences of every single treatment. It's something very difficult to find in education, although we have finding already some databases that try to give this information. And finally, uh, since I propose uh, the group control, maybe we have to normalize the the participation on educational research projects, like, for example, educational trials, the same way we do in in medicine, where it is very well uh, established what should have to be done. So it is my humble uh, uh, portion to this. And I would like to finish with uh, this uh, sentence that evidence-based make up to move slower, but with very well-fundamented steps. So thank you very much. Questions. Thank you very much, Tony. Okay, I think uh, we have uh, we can see all of the presentations. Very interesting ones. There is uh, a lot of comments on the chat and uh, new ideas, etc. Now we have a few uh, minutes if we would like to share uh, more comments. I don't know if the members of the panel uh, would like to add something or to ask to the other members of the panel. Now it's time to do it. Uh, some of you would like to say something. Andrea? Yes, uh, I think that uh, I would suggest that we read what uh, Mirovsky has recently written of open science in relation to the hijacking of the open science process by what he calls uh, uh, platform capitalism. Those who know Mirosky may say that Mirosky is obsessed with uh, the neoliberal conspiracy concept, but uh, whether this is probably true, he's probably obsessed with the neoliberal uh, compact and conspiracy, but he makes the point very, indeed, very, very well in a very convincing way, in the sense that um, all the all the elements he's pointing the finger to in his in his work, and maybe I will give you the reference in a moment, go in the very right direction. And if you read this uh, this other book, sorry, showing books all the time, but this this is the second book from Bjornofson and McAfee. Uh, written after the second machine age, um, with a description of what ca um, what uh, platform capitalism is, it's obvious that platform capitalism does not stop before the door of academia and will, uh, as it is uh, uh, invading uh, open science, uh, I may well suspect it is invading open education as well. So if we give some thought to this idea that there is indeed some neoliberal agenda of um, aggressing, of the diminishing of down 
downsizing uh, public uh, uh, and state-sponsored education system, if this is true, if this is exist, uh, then maybe we, um, we could read what Mirosky writes and, and analyze what we do and see if we are prey to the same kind of, uh, of mechanism. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Because there is a two questions or different questions on the chat. For instance, what theoretical perspective might be relevant for researching open education? I think you mentioned different books uh, and different authors and also uh, put different links to uh, books on the chat. No? And here, um, Paul <laughs> made another question. If you want to comment this or say something, Paul? Paul? Oh, your uh, your yes. microphone is uh, is mute. Uh, I love the work yes. that Andrea was referring to um, platform capitalism, and I just had a thought: uh, our high impact journals and how had that the publishing houses actually become another form of platform capitalism. I know it's sort of transferring a a notion uh, in a, from a specific context into another context. But when Andrea was was speaking, I was just wondering the same principles of platform capitalism can actually be applied to Taylor and Francis and Elsevier and all the other publishing houses for that matter. Okay, I don't know if you uh, presenters, the members of the panel have any other comment, the other question? Yes, I, I would like... <laughs> no. yeah. Uh, this uh, okay. Uh, I try to say some some things that would be a little bit controversial. It was made on purpose. One of those things is medicine and education. Of course, it is very different. But uh, okay, uh, we have our vice president, uh, as Jesus Maria knows, is, is she is from from medicine, and she uh, made that to, made the, me to see that they are so also they are very very different in the fundamentals in the in some aspects in the way of working they are maybe very close one to the other in the way that you have one doctor or one teacher in front of someone have to, to make something and okay medicine the, the output is very clear you feel better and better is quite clear in medicine uh, you succeed and in education it, the better is not so clear of one we have seen in one of the presenter, but of course you make an intervention and after, um, after that intervention you have an effect. So why I would like to today that uh, relationship between both cases because in, in medicine evidence-based research is something that is very established, and but 30, 40 years ago it was not so well established, and actually every doctor did uh, as they did uh, as they thought. And if you have a problem, you went to a doctor and you were, his opinion and his experience was above the evidence-based experience. So it's something that in maybe in education is happening. I remember to be in some education congresses that were uh, many of researchers, uh, mainly in didactics, or talking about didactics of physics and, and mathematics, were worried because no teacher were, uh, was applying their findings. So, uh, okay, they were making a very good research. They were making a very good finding very good evidences of how to, to uh, have to do things. But all those things was just inside their uh, journals. No practitioner of physics or mathematics were applying their results. And this is more or less the same situation that we found in medicine some years ago. On the other hand, mm -hmm. what we find uh, sometimes in education is that I have seen some comments also about uh, control group tri uh, trials or randomized uh, control groups and, and so on, everything like that uh, uh, and other things like that. Uh, okay, but in education, what we see many times is that someone decides to make a change for uh, a political change, and that change is applied in all the country and all the region automatically with uh, no evidence, with no proper test. And, it's, and it's something very dangerous. And for example, we ne none of us would take a medicine with a previous con uh, uh, with a previous test. For example, probably you will, will take a medicine if you with, uh, are say that that medicine has been tested in several countries in the world with many different people, 
and it has shown that in eighty percent of the cases it worked. And in education, we are not we are not doing that. We are making the change, and if it works, okay. If it doesn't work, we fail. But we fail with everybody. Probably I'm talking about the the Spanish experience that, uh, is, uh, as Jose Maria knows, we have many changes in education along the the years because of several ministries uh, we, we have. And in other countries, probably it is and different. But what I would like to draw the attention is that in that way that education is very important. It is important to have some kind of evidence that we are when we are going to perform a change. That change, which effect will it have? It will have. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Um, Andrea, you raise your hand. That, that all these things are in a sense complicated. You were talking about medicine uh, as part of the uh, of the general disgregation of the of the trust in expertise, which is part of the crisis of. Uh, induced also to a large extent by the new media. We have now situation like on, vac on vaccines where people uh, don't take vaccines because uh, they are they believe in the conspiracy theory uh, whereby new pharma uh, want to hide links between autism and vaccines. Now we know that uh, the new pharma are responsible for many actual conspiracy but we know that this is not one of them so that there is no link between vaccines and, and um, uh, and, and autism, but still how do you intervene, especially when you have in front of you a plateau of young people, uh, how you teach them how do you disentangle, you know, a clear conspiracy, conspiracy theory like uh, chemtrial, no, uh, from from the one about vaccines, which may actually result in them not vaccinating their own uh, children. Um, Evidence-based medicine. Uh, I don't know if you heard. Um, Ioannidis has published a lot about that. Uh, there are many concerns that evidence-based medicine has been has become um, finance-based medicine because again of this uh, new pharma and um, high level of uh, corruption uh, I can give you a reference maybe about that so really these things are, are linked um, and and we cannot uh, um, relax in this context because we are continuously being challenged and our belief are continuously being challenged in in uh, um, in this uh, atmosphere of uh, distrust and competition and conspiracy. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. Mirette, you, will, you say, will you like to say something or no? Mirette? Open your microphone if you would like to say something. No? It's just a little delay when you go to change your microphone. It just delays a little few seconds before it uh, turns on. I think that was one of the main things, um, this whole conversation about how, I suppose, it, you, you know, if you want to classify it as a neoliberal agenda and how finance and how, as I said, the business models of, for us, the commercial platforms are now affecting how the type and how we do our research um, I think we've been, we started a conversation with the, our provider and our platform about this, and it started from a position of them um, provide telling us how they thought that we should do it to a point where we had to engage quite a bit with them about how we want what we want to do, the objective, etc. And it was through a very a long process of very structured dialogue that we came to a position where we were happy with research questions that we wanted to ask were being addressed in the way we wanted to, um, them to be. But we were also aware that there were some limitations still in place that we had to engage with as well. And some of those limitations were things well beyond the uh, platform providers that are there from, I suppose, what I call supranational organizations such as the European Union. They came in with others there are other contexts, so I don't think it's just limited to mere financials. So my point is, like issues like GDPR become really, really important in a research um, perspective. So they become the issue because they have consequences both for the platforms but also from us as we do our research. So I think this question isn't as easy. The you know again because of the multitude of contexts bearing down on how we're researching in particular ways and particularly in our own context for doing MOOC related research 
that I think has a significant weight. But I don't think it's simply just a single causal effect. There's multiple contexts that need to be taken into account. Um, so I think for me, we need to be a little bit more aware of that when we think about it. And also just in response to some of the chat that's come up, I think our claims also have to be contextualized. They also have to be put some, in some sort of historical context as well. I think that's another thing that I would also say um, with regards to some of the research, even though it may be empirical in nature. I think there's a historical, there's a, a historical um, placing of that research. Um, and I think that we need to be more cognizant of that as we review, as we engage, as we write, as we disseminate um, our research more broadly. Thank you very much, Andrea. I oh, think cool. I'm sorry, Andrea. <laughs> so, <Mary, but>, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think now it's time to more or less to finish. Uh, I, I, to me, it, it, it was a very, really interesting uh, webinar because uh, there is, uh, to me, uh, there were very interesting comments and points, and also during the chat. I have also a personal question, not for instance, uh, yes, I agree with, uh, in particular with uh, Paul when he said uh, it is not uh, 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 research without evidence, but why in the area of education we insist a lot on evidence? That is maybe because in, a, in another ways, in another period of time, we did research without evidence. I don't know, no, but this is a, a, a very important point uh, to today's. Uh, and also, mm, to me, it was very interesting some of the comments related to the wired uh, journals, no? this idea from the vision uh, from uh, particular uh, journals or in particular also some um, publisher companies. Uh, let me say, just an editor, uh, as editor, uh, the same like my editor, uh, sometimes it depends also from the editor point of view. And I think editors uh, have a very important role in order to decide and select uh, good papers. Uh, and I hope and I think and I'm sure that the editors uh, take in account a different perspective, no? And, and for instance, we have uh, uh, examples in the journal that we have here in Eden. Uh, it's called Eurold, uh, and also the, the journal that we are leading with my red, which is an open journal, of no APCs under a platform from Springer, which is something that we uh, achieve uh, because the editors uh, fade for that and, and decide to um, maintain the journal open in this sense. Okay, thank you very much for your participation. Um, I would like just to say uh, two things more. One is, uh, of course, you know that this uh, webinar uh, is recorded and will be uh, on our web page, on the Eden web page. You can see all of the comments and the chat, etc and access again to the participations and the presentations. And let me remain uh, our next uh, meeting, the next meeting, uh, it's uh, our uh, annual conference uh, on Bruges, Belgium, uh, in 16 to 19 on June. Uh, I hope to meet you there, and we have the opportunity to see each other uh, in presence in, in in Bruges. And let me say also a, a short mention to another interesting and important meeting in November uh, uh, hosted by uh, Dublin uh, City University. Uh, it's the ICDE General Conference in, uh, from 3 to 7 of November. Thank you very much uh, for all of you. Bye-bye.